Friends, we are back in the California Republic after traversing the European continent backwards, forwards, and up and down to drive either fancy cars in rather fancy locations or family cars also in fancy locations. And while we were doing that, we missed the opportunity to drive this in a technical location, uh, the 2017 Mercedes-Benz E-Class, the 10th generation. Uh, so we had the opportunity to get the car as soon as we returned to the California Republic. So while we work on the full first drive review, let's you and I do a tech review and I'm going to forewarn you, there's a lot of shit you and I need to go through here, so definitely get your notebooks out. But with that, let's start with the greasy bits, which is really the place we always start, and then we'll cascade our way through to the newfangled stuff that came from Silicon Valley, where this car was last week. So with that, to the engine. Now, before we dive into this engine, you may hear a very faint sound of a slow moving aircraft. Uh, it's actually not an airplane, it is the Goodyear blimp. Uh, if you are new to our show, I was given a once in a lifetime opportunity by the fine folks at Goodyear Airship Operations in Carson, California, about 20 miles from here. Uh, they taught me how to pilot this thing. Uh, so you guys need to check out that episode. We put together like a two part hour and a half documentary and it's not just me flying it, it's me learning how to, to maintain it, how they keep it in the air, how they travel with it. It's, it's an incredibly cool story. Make sure you check that out. I'll put like a little annotation or some sort of card for you to click so you can get right to that. Uh, anyway, back to this engine. So this is an engine where, I know I've said this to you before, uh, deja vu. We have been here before. This is the two liter, four cylinder, direct injected, turbocharged gas engine that we drove in the C-Class Coupe. But here it is in a much larger package, the midsize E-Class. Uh, and here it is the same output, 241 horsepower, 273 pound feet of torque. Uh, the, the torque comes in at a relatively low engine speed of about 2,000 rpm. But really what we need to do when we get into the full first drive review of this car is to unpack how this engine works in this larger package. Now how does it get power to the wheels? Now in this case this is the 4MATIC. This is all-wheel drive. But this car is also on offer in two-wheel drive. Either case you can get any transmission you want as long as it's that 9G Tronic that Mercedes is starting to cascade throughout the entire line. You and I have already driven it in the GLE 450 Coupe, the C450 AMG, which is now the C43 AMG, and that SL550. So make sure you check out those episodes before you get into this first drive review episode, which will come after this. So basically, I'm giving you a lot of homework to really unpack how this works in a larger car. Now, we need to put all of this aside and press on to the bits, and it's not the normal stuff that affects driving dynamics because there's some significant changes here. Now, over the past couple of years, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about taxes here on the old show, and you're probably wondering, why the hell are we going to talk about taxes when we have a cool, new, and rather important car to discuss? Uh, well, that's because most manufacturers, especially large companies like Mercedes, are trying to determine ways to balance performance, comfort, size with different changing tax schemes around the world, whether it be like a displacement tax, a gas guzzler tax, or a CO2 type tax. Now here, this is a very important car to apply all of this to, because think of this as like business class. So they wanted to maintain size and performance, but still focus on efficiency. So the first thing we already discussed, which was that four cylinder engine. Now outside of the US, that is nothing new. But here, this is the first time that a four cylinder is being offered with a E-Class. Uh, but it doesn't really stop there. Dimensions change as well. But in the opposite direction than you think. It's not smaller, it's actually larger. So the wheelbase is 2.6 inches larger, the length 1.7 inches. But once again, doesn't stop there. Because if you think about it, if you're making the car bigger, you're going to have to balance out with some sort of weight reduction somewhere. So that's where you have things like aluminum here, here, and here, as well as whole sections of the structure, that's combined with high strength steel. And again, the idea is to lower the overall weight. Now, 
Let's put aside the tax talk and get to the stuff that gets us car guys and gals excited, and that is suspension bits. This one has the adjustable air ride fitted, and that's optional. And we've driven that in what the C450 Sport and the C400 way long ago. Uh, but this one's a bit different in that it has three air chambers in each strut here and two air chambers in each strut here. And it really does two things. Yes, it adjusts the firmness of the air ride. So basically you get your E-Class slammed on bags so you can go from comfort all the way up to Sport Plus in this case. But really, again, efficiency. So the idea is to use the air ride to adjust the ride height to increase the efficiency of the air over the car to increase the overall fuel efficiency of the vehicle get it and i will say there is an odd side benefit i don't want to call it benefit more of like a consequence there are times that you walk up to the car or walk away from the car and let's just say it sounds like um there's no good way to put this it has a bit of a gas problem and with that um the color uh we talked about in the s63 coupe episode that uh, killers don't buy silver cars even in the business class segment silver is a terrible color for this thing and i say this from experience because we actually got to see this car very early on like right before christmas remember the uh, gls episode we did from Österreich? uh well we actually flew to stuttgart uh just after that to see the e-class and they showed us these like beautiful green colors like the s65 they showed us like this like burgundy and it just makes the lines on this car pop silver blah and again killers don't buy silver cars but you know what think of this as like a bonus question do you like this type of silver even with this blue hue and i'm gonna i like blue but still silver not exciting anyway bonus question do you like the color if not what would you like to see let's press on to the other big changes and that's on the inside now this is the point of the episode where you guys actually need to get your notebook out because as much as we have covered thus far, there are more changes on the inside of this thing. But first, we absolutely need to start the engine because I got to tell you, I stepped off the plane from Munich and it has been broiling here in Los Angeles for the past couple of days, but I digress. So let's first talk about design. Now, I never like to tell you guys about what you can see. But here, there are a couple of things we need to unpack about the design. Uh, number one, yes, this is borrowed from the S-Class. It's actually two separate displays in here. Uh, but number two, and more importantly, Gordon, who runs design for Mercedes, they chose to give the E-Class its own personality on uh, the interior, and really a distinct personality at that. Do you remember when we drove the E400 convertible as like a goodbye and farewell from Cayo Hueso? And we really pointed out the interior there was really dated. Here, this even leapfrogs the S-Class, in my opinion, and mainly because the way this thing is so much lower and you feel more sporty in here. Uh, but remember, we talked about how we went on that trip to drive the GLS, and they showed us the car uh, in early December. They really showed us four cars, and the reason why they showed us four cars is because they're doing four different themes on the interior. Uh, this is like the techno modern interior. That's with the piano black here with the wavy lines. Now, normally I am not a fan of piano black, but here I actually like it a lot with the wavy lines. But the one to have, it's more of a brown interior. But the reason why you want it is twofold. You can have an open pour wood with these same wavy lines, but then the dash top is like fitted with leather and there's a seam here. The only way to have this car uh, but really let's put aside design and we need to focus on controls now we've driven a lot of mercedes here on the old show so this is nothing new to us here the controller here where you write in the characters or this main knob here or even the secondary controls here and here cadillac can definitely take a page out of this book with hard repeatable buttons for the hvac as well as the main applications here and by the way, nice touch with an analog clock. Uh, that soon will be an IWC when we drive the E63, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. It's really here we need to focus on. There are two capacitive touch five-way controllers here. The one over here controls the trip computer in front of you. So you can scroll between anything you've seen in any Mercedes-Benz for the past, like, I want to say five years. The only thing they added was this eco display. 
Over here, this one's more important. This one controls this screen here. But if you remember from Mercedes-Benz of the past, they had a menu here with a sub-menu here. Now what they've done with the UX is they've put the menu over to the side. So I can start out by going to this like home button here or even one here. So let's go over to the system function. We want to go here for one specific reason. Uh, there are themes here, right? And here as well. Well, you can do themes here too. So let's go into display and designs. Let's go to design. Now, right now we're in this like modern techno progressive thing. This is my least favorite. There is a classic one. And notice I can click the button here and it switches the display in front of me. And this goes to something you've seen in other Mercedes for years. Although the actual the, the numerical display, it looks like a more modern Breitling watch. But my favorite is this sport one here where it gives you more of like a 3D view of like a traditional uh, two analog gauge setup. Very cool. But wait, there's more. You can actually change the lighting of the car. So let's go back to uh, the lighting and notice you've got lighting here, lighting here, as well as here. There are up to 64 different shades that you can play around here and I'm sure uh, with the magic of editing you can see this at night. Uh, now let's press on to one other item here. This is the second Mercedes-Benz that we will drive that is fitted with Apple CarPlay and we are going to do a separate standalone episode where we're going to use this Apple CarPlay integration. Now what's different here, I can tell you right off the bat, it actually has wireless charging, a Qi set up here, so uh, any type of iOS device out of the box, basically your SOL. So this is great for Google, but not great for iOS unless you get some sort of like adapter thing here. And you can go through the regular menu here like you did in that SL63, check out that episode, we did that already. And then you can go back into the Mercedes-Benz UX, go back to our radio. Now, we got to put all this aside because as many changes as we have here, there's still more to cover. And for that, we have to go on a bit of a walking tour of the car. And now, for something completely different. Uh, so if you joined us in Spain for our Volvo S90 episode, you know we spent a lot of time talking about autonomous driving, specifically the different levels of autonomous driving. Uh, well, friends, for a first in the Mercedes-Benz world, I give you level dry. Now, you're probably thinking, what the hell does that mean? Well, it means that this thing will drive by itself at high speeds, people. Now, as cool as that is, there's a little asterisk there. How fast will it drive by itself? Well, the engineers in Stuttgart have blessed this to drive autonomously up to 131 miles an hour. Now, as cool as that is, there is a party trick that is cooler. Uh, but to get it to work, you need to have your butt in the driver's seat, driving up to 131 miles an hour, really the car doing it for you. And then what you would do is you would hold the turn signal for two seconds. Now I've played around with this thing for a couple of days now. You gotta hold it for more than two seconds for it to actually work. Uh, but the car will change lanes by itself. I know, incredibly cool. But there is like a legalese asterisk there. Uh, basically, it will do it if it does not detect anything in the lane next to you. Now you're probably asking, well, how does it detect anything over here? The car's over here. Well, that people, that brings up the point. You see, that might look like a German luxury car, but really it's a German AWACS plane because it can see better than you. It's got a camera here. It's got stereo cameras over here that have been pilfered from the S-Class. It's got like some radar thingy here. It's got another camera here, a bigger radar thing here, a smaller radar thing here. You think we're done yet? Oh no. Uh, then there's another camera here. Come on back here. There's another radar thing here. And then the piece de resistance is a like pop-out camera back here, which I'd like to point out. This also works for uh, the rear view camera. It's like 4K almost. It's very cool. Uh, now that is all great. There's a lot of input devices here, but really that is fed into like one giant black box, which previously was called Distronic Plus. And you know, God bless Mercedes, but th there is some guy that sits in a room and his entire job is coming up with the most moronic names for Mercedes-Benz technologies. Like this one, 
he, he seemed to really be into the word pilot because there are like five different systems that's pilot this or pilot that, you know, pilot pet your dog, whatever it is. But basically, what it does is a couple of different things. So number one, you know how you get into traffic. Like you people that live in DC, you know, you give us crap here in LA about our traffic. DC, a million times worse. So if you're on like 66 and you're trying to go down into the city, um, there is invariably always traffic. Well, this car, you know how a lot of new cars, even like Kias, have like active brake assist where the car will brake itself if it senses like cars stopped in front of you. Well, now what this like pilot something or other does, it senses the density of traffic that there is like a whole like tailback of traffic and that the car should slow itself down. So that is actually new that goes into this black box thing here. Uh, then there is this other thing that is called car to x Now, who, obviously this person that's like trapped in a room coming up with these names, he apparently likes algebra. And what this is, think of it as like one grand Wi-Fi system, but it uses the car and even your smartphone to communicate with other cars and other smartphones. So you guys remember like way back in the day, like five years ago, I did this moronic thing at Ford Proving Grounds where I acted like I was like this important businessman in one car and this teenage girl that wasn't paying attention in another car and they were about to hit each other and there was this vehicle to vehicle technology that kept me from killing myself. I, it's confusing. I was young and I needed the money. But anyway, back to the Mercedes. Um, so basically what this does, it talks to cars like around the bend over there to see if there's like traffic or something, some sort of impending issue that the car should avoid or slow down for or something like that. Now, as cool as that is, this, you need other cars like this and you need more smartphones that would talk to this car and do all sorts of things. So think of this as very much the early days of like Betamax. Get it? And then, uh, you know how you and I did the party trick of like driving the car itself? We did it with an E-Class convertible in Denmark and then an S-Class up in Canada and then off camera. I do this with my friends. I love scaring the crap out of my friends with the automatic driving. But again, I digress. Um, that system, Distronic Plus, it will drive the car by itself for 15 seconds. Here, I've been playing with this thing now for three days and I haven't figured out what like the magic number is. It does yell at you to put your hands back on the wheel, but it like varies depending on the scenario. So come back for the full first drive review and you and I will try to ascertain what that number is. So in summary, what do we got? Uh, well, this is definitely the reinvention of arguably the most important car for Mercedes-Benz worldwide. But we need to put that aside because this car has importance not just to car guys and gals like us, but to general people who drive or even have a passing interest in cars. Because think of this as a carrying case. And follow me here for a minute. This is a carrying case that now has virtually all the different technologies that you and I have driven in virtually every other car, whether it be construction methods, engine efficiency, or now technologies that we've seen in their emphases in other cars now have become somewhat maybe adolescent, and they're all in one handy dandy German carrying case. So this is an important car, and we have to really spend some time unpacking it in the full first drive review, and not the usual like pulling power and driving dynamics, but some other stuff beyond like CarPlay. So make sure you come back for that. Now I want to put this aside and address something incredibly important about this. And yes, this is going to be my frustrated inner designer coming out. This is now the medium-sized version of the S-Class. And basically what this is, is a design strategy of taking one design theme, which was set by the S-Class, and then making it in small, medium, and large. Actually, there's like an extra small if you really think about the CLA, but let's put that aside. So my question is very specific. Do you like the small, medium, and large? And this is not the only company doing it. Like for example, Jaguar does it, and definitely Audi does it. Or would you rather see something where it's like, here's the S-Class, and that design is all by itself over there, and the S-Class and the E-Class are separated, and then the C-Class would be separated further. So basically, more of an individual design language depending on the size of the car, kind of like what they did on the interior of this car. So don't just tell me which one you would prefer, tell me why you would prefer it. And you know what, for good measure, let me know what you currently drive. Let me know 
know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV All in Word, Moto Man TV All in Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I want to leave you with two things. Number one, an update for our app. Some of you have very kindly given us some feedback that we had a problem with the Instagram and the photo section of it. There was an Instagram API change. We have subsequently changed the UX a little bit. So there will no longer be a problem when Instagram changes their API. Thank you very much for the feedback and sending screenshots of updates to both the iOS or on the Android side of the house. And for those of you that have yet to download our fancy new mobile application, which is now new and improved, you can download it for free from Apple iTunes or Google Play. And number two, a fun fact. So if you are a Mercedes-Benz fanboy or you have owned a couple of Mercedes-Benz over the years, you know that there is a sticker on the lower right-hand corner of the windshield that is signed by like a German guy. And his name is Gottlieb Daimler, one of the founders of Daimler-Benz AG. Uh, well, this car, has a different sticker on it. It was signed by Carl Benz. Until I see you for the full first drive review of the 2017 E300 Fish Beta.